All right. So welcome to today's program, uh, Anthropology and History Beyond the Academy. Uh, it's presented by the UNF Digital Humanities Institute uh, to conclude DHI's uh, 2021 Digital Projects Showcase. In addition, this session is the first in an ongoing roundtable series on the importance of public scholarship that will continue in spring 2022. Uh, my name is Dr. Justin Sipes. I'm the Assistant Director with the Center for Community-Based Learning, and I'll serve as the moderator for today's discussion. A few logistics for today's session. We ask that everyone remains muted while not speaking. If you'd like to ask a question, please use the raise hand feature or type questions into the chat feature. As a reminder, today's session is, is being recorded for future access at the Digital Humanities Institute website under the events portion of the website. Uh, before we continue, I would like to ask Dr. Ann Pfister, Associate Professor of Anthropology and Director of the UNF Digital Humanities Institute to please introduce herself, tell us a little bit more about the UNF Digital Humanities Institute, and then to announce this year's projects of merit. Great, thank you, Dr. Seitz. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for being here. My name, as Justin said, is uh, Ann Fister, and I'm Associate Professor of Anthropology here at the University of North Florida and Director of the Digital Humanities Institute, or DHI. The DHI promotes collaboration on interdisciplinary projects that combine the use of technology with materials and methodologies from the humanities, fine arts, and social sciences. The DHI is composed of faculty and students across UNF, it's an intercollegial institute bringing student and faculty interests and expertise together through a variety of venues, including this week's DHI Digital Project Showcase and several community connections, some of which we'll hear about this afternoon. I wanna take a moment to thank all of this year's participants in DHI's sixth annual digital, digital Projects Showcase, which was held virtually all this week and will continue to be available for your reference. On our, you can access that on our website. Congratulations to the students, the uh, student presenters, our faculty presenters, and faculty mentors on all the fantastic projects this year. Based upon the input from the DHI Advisory Committee, the DHI would like to recognize these three projects of merit from the 2021 showcase. We would like to recognize Stacy Harmer, Lynn Hemingway, Sergio Mora and Alexandra Zapata for their project entitled Dulcinea No Perece, Don Quixote in the Cave Escape Room. Um, and congratulations to those presenters and faculty mentor, Dr. Maria Angeles Fernandez Cifuentes. We would also like to recognize Aaron Ogronnik, sorry, Aaron, if I mispronounced your name for her project, Alternative Methods of Obtaining and Integrating Geospatial Data, the Future of Student Research, and congratulations also to her faculty mentor, Dr. Chris Baynard. And then finally, we would like to recognize um, Dr. Constanza Lopez Vaquero and Michael Boyles for their project, Voces y Caras, Hispanic Communities of North Florida. Muchas felicidades, congratulations uh, for all the, um, to these researchers and we look forward to hearing about all the research projects moving forward in your work. So moving on to our roundtable event, um, I just wanted to mention that I set a few goals for my two year term as DHI director. As an anthropologist, these goals include bringing in more social science projects um, and perspectives generally. After all, um, oh, sorry, and, and broadening the focus of digital to include technology more generally. After all, in the field of anthropology, technology is nearly synonymous with human culture and ingenuity and is studied as a crucial component of our evolution as a species. In other words, technology is something that makes us very uniquely human. I'm also interested in underscoring the importance of public scholarship, which is the inspiration for this roundtable series. So today's roundtable, Anthropology and History Beyond the Academy, is the first in a series of discussions aimed at better understanding the importance of public scholarship. 
So today we hear from three guests interested in the cultures and histories of the Southeastern United States past and present. We welcome anthropologist, Dr. Keith Ashley, who runs the UNF Archaeology Lab and also our summer archaeology field school. Two incredible assets to our department, the Department of uh, Sociology, Anthropology, and Social Work, our UNF campus, and the greater Jacksonville area. Each summer, Dr. Ashley promises his students that they'll find artifacts right here in town 30 minutes from campus, and they do. Their findings captivate the imaginations of so many of us. You've likely seen Dr. Ashley and his students in local news publications, thanks to his dedication to public education. We'll also hear from Dr. Denise Bosi, Associate Professor of History. Dr. Bosi specializes in cross-cultural relations between Indians, Europeans, and Africans in the early South. She's, she is a dedicated mentor and scholar whose many accomplishments include writing what is thought to be the first book on the Yamasee Indians who lived in Florida, Georgia, and South Carolina. Her work has earned the support of the National Endowment for the Humanities, encounters many long-held myths about the indigenous peoples of our area, a goal she and Dr. Ashley share in their many collaborative efforts, which include the Jacksonville Beaches Museum exhibit designed in 2019 and 20 with UNS students, a current DHI project. Um, hold on a second, <laughs> I find my rest of my notes. Uh, a, a current DH project with a uh, uh, with and by UNS students and a book project in progress that's titled, and I hope I, my pronunciation serves here, Eka Utimile, Our Land, an Indigenous History of Northeast Florida. All three projects are public facing and focus on local Indigenous archaeology and history. We look forward to hearing more about those projects today. And finally, we'll hear from Kaylee Crawford, who studied under Dr. Ashley, Dr. Bosi, myself, and many of our colleagues. She graduated from UNS in 2019 with a BA in history and a BA in anthropology, earning honors in both degrees. She served as the founding president of UNS chapter of Lambda Alpha, the National Honor Society for Anthropology. She's worked at various national parks throughout the Southeast and currently serves as a park ranger for the Charles Pickney National Historic Site in Charleston, South Carolina. We're glad to welcome Kaylee back to UNF for today's roundtable, as her year early career really embodies one of the ways that scholarship serves in national public spaces. And last but not least, today's roundtable is moderated by Dr. Justin Sipes, Assistant Director of the Senator for Community-Based Learning here at UNF. In his daily work, Dr. Sipes supports and facilitates the development of faculty, staff, and students to conduct community engagement activities. One component of this is identifying and emphasizing high quality community engaged activities, which typically involve various forms of public scholarship. His work is part of UNF's ongoing integration of community engagement throughout the institution and as part of UNF's commitment to the Carnegie Community Engagement elective classification. So I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Seitz now and I thank you all again for being here. Uh, thank you, Anne, for those wonderful introductions. and. Uh just on behalf of everyone, we appreciate the your guidance and leadership uh, to make this week successful in organizing today's session. And uh, special congratulations to all the recipients of the Projects of Merit and to all those who participated in this year's showcase. Um, with that, it's time to hear from today's panelists. Uh, so as previously mentioned, we we're fortunate to have three individuals, uh, Dr. De Denise Bosi, uh, Dr. Keith Ashley, and Kaylee Crawford, uh, all whose work is extremely uh, prescient for today's conversation. Uh, so at this point, I'm going to let the panelists introduce themselves a little bit further uh, to provide a little bit more context and background as to how their research and work connects to public scholarship. Uh, so let's start off with uh, Dr. Denise Bosi, who will also provide us with the land acknowledgement. Well, hello, everyone, and a big thank you to Anne for putting this together and to Justin for moderating and shepherding our discussion. Um, I just want to preface this with I have a head cold, and so um, every once in a while you'll see me turn off my screen just to, you know, blow my nose or whatever I need to do, but I'm still here. Um, and I'm just so excited to be here and to talk about public archaeology and public history. 
So I'm an associate professor in the history department. I've been here 14 years. And I know that because my daughter was one when we came here and now she's 15 and taller than me. Um, and I came here because I was really interested in local archives and being close to the resources that I need. And very quickly, um, almost instantaneously, in fact, before I even arrived, had students pulling me into public history um, and reaching out and contacting me and wanting to go not only to learn about local indigenous history, which I was already sort of a specialist in, in the sense that I studied the Native South, but also wanting to commit in terms of their careers to public history. Um, and so I've really been lagging behind them and following them and trying to encourage them. And they have rightly pulled me into this public space. Um, so I'm gonna start with just a very brief uh, greeting um, that I'm gonna mispronounce in our, our local indigenous language in Mokama. And um, this reading was written by Dr. Dr. Aaron Broadwell at the University of Florida, who's currently reconstructing our local Mokama language, which is one of the dialects of Tamukwa. And then I'm gonna read um, a land acknowledgement that I worked up last year for UNF. So, hita puenonake terala isako nimane akala. And this basically means it's good that y'all have come and I'm very happy. I liked that he put it in a Southern, <laughs> with a Southern twist too. So we gratefully acknowledge today that we are on the unceded ancestral homelands of the Mokama speaking Tamukwas. We recognize that other indigenous people also built homelands here, including the Yamases and Wales. For thousands of years, indigenous people made this region into a vibrant center of diplomacy, exchange and religious practice. We pay respect to these nations and to their descendants. We further recognize the historical and ongoing impact of colonization in our region and state, as well as the resiliency of indigenous people. Today, Florida is home to the sovereign nations of the Seminole tribe of Florida and Miccosukee tribe of Indians of Florida, as well as citizens of other native nations and communities whose ancestors include Mokamas, Yamases, and Wales. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Denise. Uh, so now we'll move over to Kaylee, if you don't mind introducing yourself and providing us a little bit more about your background. Absolutely. Can, can I get a thumbs up if you can hear me okay? Everybody give me a thumbs up if you can hear and see me all right. Okay, thank you. Historic home and questionable internet. Uh, thank you all so much for allowing me to be here. It is a true honor to be able to speak alongside my former mentors, um, my former professors. Um, I actually fondly remember um, that I asked to step out of Dr. Bosi's class about 10 minutes early, um, and I received one of my first National Park Service position offers uh, after taking your American Colonial uh, in Kinship class. Uh, so I will always remember that moment. Um, I've been working with the Park Service in various capacities for about five years. Um, I secured my permanence with the National Park Service and my long-term federal, federal career. Um, I've been in that position for about two years now, um, so I will be spending the next 30 or so years uh, wearing this uniform. Um, I really have, uh, in the past two years, uh, grown a little bit more specific in my, uh, in my scope and in my topics. Um, I worked for uh, the majority of this time in Beaufort, South Carolina at Reconstruction Era National Historical Park, um, really focusing on uh, the transition from an enslaved society to a free society, doing a lot of research and work in the post-Civil War Reconstruction field, um, and connecting people uh, to this very important historical and anthropological topic. Um, you know, parks are spaces that are really both uh, history sites and anthropology sites. We do a lot in this area um, of the Low Country in the Charleston area, talking about the Gullah Geechee culture, uh, which developed in this area along the coastline. Um, this is uh, Native American Heritage Month. This is the month that the Department of the Interior, um, who is above the National Park Service that we recognize in indigenous cultures. Um, and so we do talk about Yamasi as well as Kiwa and Stono uh, tribes in this area as well. 
Um, I currently work for the Charleston area sites. Um, I'm stationed mostly at the Charles Pickney National Historic Site. Um, this is an 1828 plantation home and a site of enslavement. Uh, we are currently redoing the exhibits, um, going away from talking about the singular perspective of Charles Pickney, which is one gentleman who signed the Constitution, uh, and we're working towards kind of going for the larger scope and the larger conversation, uh, the Constitution and how that's changed over time, um, you know, the legacy and history and you know, hard conversation points of plantations in the Southeast, um, their ties to South Carolinian economy um, and the different discussions leading towards secession. Um, and so we have a lot of things to talk about at this site. Um, I also work for uh, Fort Sumter National Historical Park, uh, which is the site where the Civil War began in the Charleston Harbor, uh, April 12th, 1861. And then we also manage Fort Moultrie National Historical Park, which was used during the Revolutionary War, the Civil War, World War I, and World War II. Uh, so my historical scope is very, very large. Um, but my goal um, with my work through the National Park Service um, has always been and will always be connecting the average person to our larger important historical stories. Um, not everyone who enters our national park sites are historians, are anthropologists, are subject matter experts. And so our goal as the National Park Service and my personal goal is to facilitate emotional connections with the public between them and these important sites. Why do these sites, which are federally funded and federally managed, matter in the larger scheme of things? Uh, how does the average individual entering this park site, who maybe they're not from South Carolina, maybe they emigrated recently from a different country, maybe their family fought in the Civil War for one side or the other, how can they personally connect to these sites and how can we make them relevant to the average person entering today? And so that's my kind of scope, um, especially in the past two-ish years um, with uh, COVID and the pandemic, um, there has been such an emphasis on digital connection, um, and we did an, an amazing job at that, uh, working at Reconstruction Air National Historical Park. And so part of the reason that I transferred to the Charleston area sites is to bring some of that knowledge and scope from a site where it was very successful and bringing it to these sites here now. So um, as we talk more, I'll talk a little bit more about how we engage with the public digitally as well. But again, thank you so much uh, for allowing me the time to be here and to speak. Great, thank you, Kaylee, for the, uh, that and just hearing about your background and sort of what you've been doing since you graduated from UNF. Uh, you've been very busy. So, but that's great to hear. Uh, and then uh, finally, uh, Dr. Keith Ashley, if you wouldn't mind uh, doing a little deeper introduction of yourself. Okay, um, again, thank you, Anne, for uh, allowing me to participate, Justin, for moderating. Uh, it's great to see Kelly and seeing one of our former students doing so well today out in the real world, so congratulations. Um, so I've been here roughly about the same time as Denise, about 14 years. Uh, my first 10 years, I was a uh, research coordinator for the archaeology lab and did adjunct teaching. And then four years ago, I converted to an assistant professor line. So I'm an assistant professor and an archaeologist here. Uh, my research focuses on the indigenous people of northeastern Florida. So unlike my colleagues, Dr. Rakita, who's here, who focuses on the southwestern United States, and Dr. Meyer, who's also here, who focuses more on Europe or the Mediterranean area, really my research is kind of backyard archaeology. It's right here in the Jacksonville area. So I feel a really strong commitment to make my research available to the broader community of Jacksonville, as well as the indigenous communities of Florida. Um, just my research in general is really, I believe, in the deep history of this area. So even though I have certain time periods that I focus on like a thousand years ago and maybe the 15 and 1600s, I'm really interested in the entire length of the indigenous history of this area. I think if I was a cultural anthropologist, my research would probably be considered like long-term ethnography. I really wanted to come into an area and understand that area from the initial arrival of indigenous people until their removal from that area, but their continuation today, maybe in other areas of the state. So that's really, really important to me. 
Uh, I work with students, which is great. We have summer field schools, other kind of archaeological projects that go on here in the Jacksonville area. Um, I think I try to instill in students the understanding of what we're doing in terms of indigenous histories and indigenous cultures, but also how important it is to get this information out to the general public. Because I think there's some misunderstandings about indigenous history, particularly the indigenous history of our area, which is incredibly deep, it's rich, it's diverse, it's dynamic, and it's really different than what most people think. Most people have this 10 year window in the 1560s of the Tamuqua, and they really think that's it. And there's this timeless people really haven't changed much over the past five or 6,000 years. And what we're finding out is just so different than that. Um, so I really, I think it's important to, to get it out there. Um, I like working with students and uh, that's about it. I mean, there's a lot more, but we'll get to that in time. Well, thank you all for your, the uh, introductions uh, of yourselves and your work and your research and, and how you, um, Go about what it is that you do. Uh, so we, we're going to transition to the question portion of this now. Uh, so it just as a reminder for everyone who's attending, if you have a question you'd like to ask, please use the raise your hand feature, or you can just type your questions into the chat. We'll be uh, keeping track of that as those as we go along. Um, so first for our panelists, I think it's important as we are talking about a, a concept that we need to define it, right? And so uh, this very first question is for you all, like what is public scholarship? How do you define it? And then uh, how does it manifest itself in the context of your discipline and in the context of digital humanities? And uh, whoever would like to begin from our, our panelists, please feel free to jump in. Um, I'll start if that's okay. Um, so I draw a distinction between local and public history. So I came here to be a local historian. I really wanted to live in the space that I studied. Um, and I came here very interested in um, kind of the broad region between Florida and South Carolina. We tend to divide things along state lines, but that's not the way they looked in the periods that I study. So I really focus on 16th, 17th and 18th centuries. Um, and so I've done that. I've, I've become a local historian. My first um, kind of big book manuscript is under review. It's on the Yamases. I have an edited collection on the Yamases. I held a conference in St. Augustine where I brought together all of these scholars to talk about the Yamases. And all of that's really important work, but it's really aimed at my field, at my discipline, because um, the Yamases in particular have been completely neglected by scholars in large part because they were episodically mobile. And because they moved across the South, it requires you to be proficient in archeology span as well as history. Um, what's happened increasingly is that I've moved into public history too, alongside that. And public history is quite distinct from local history. Um, it really means not just talking to your field, right? Not just talking to archeologists and historians, which I'm, I'm quite good at and I enjoy doing, um, but it requires a different framework uh, and awareness of the incomes that people have. That's part of what um, Kaylee was talking about, right? An awareness that the folks who are reading or listening or talking to you um, come from a variety of places um, and come with a variety of, of preconceptions already that you are working to nurture in some ways, but also to redirect. Um, and I think one of the big misunderstandings is in the public is what his history itself is. So I find myself communicating a lot about um, the reality that history is not a series of facts that are never changing, but is a, a selective interpretation of, of certain events. Um, and the silencing of other voices and events in the process of telling that narrative. So um, as I've moved more and more into public history, a lot of what I've spent my time doing is, is really understanding what people beyond academia know or think in our region about indigenous people. Um, and that's where Keith and I have really begun to partner in meaningful ways to understand where they're coming from and um, to really complicate that and diversify that. And, and I'll, I'll talk obviously more about how I do that um, and how others do it. So a lot of what I see myself doing as a public historian, as opposed to a local historian, is bridging that gap between kind of the cutting edge scholarship that I'm engaged in, that Keith's engaged in, that linguists are engaged in, um, and making that meaningful in a public venue, which means giving it authority and narrative um, and really understanding, I have to be very concrete in my own mind about my goals 
uh, and how I present and what I present to the public. And I do give a lot of public talks increasingly. Um, and the conversations after and during those talks are perhaps the most useful to me in helping me to become a better public scholar um, as I understand what people are interested in, you know, what they already think they know um, and how to nurture that into a kind of deeper understanding of indigenous history. And I see that as very connected to the present too. I mean, this is what public history has given to me most meaningfully. My work really matters to the present because when we erase indigenous people from the past, we also erase them from the present. Um, and that means that people aren't paying attention to aware of indigenous issues in our state today, in our nation today. But once we raise awareness of indigenous power and significance in the past, we then compel people to think about the present. And that is what is most important to me about public history. Oh, go ahead, Kelly. Yep, I'll go next if that's okay. Um, so what is public scholarship? I think that public scholarship is literally making the professors and the academics work that world accessible to the average lay person, if you will. Um, I think that my work through the National Park Service, but then just the larger scope of the field of public history, um, cultural sites, um, you know, state parks, museums, um, that is this field of public scholarship where we're the liaison between the academic world and then making it accessible to the average visitor, the average person, the person who might not have the opportunity to go the extra mile and do research and go to school. But it's creating this um, kind of th this framework to allow these larger, bigger topics of history, of anthropology, things that matter, and making it more accessible and understandable to the average person. Um, you know, that's, like I mentioned earlier, kind of has always been my personal goal. Um, you know, people ask me, often why I was inspired uh, to have a career in the park service and what led me on this path. Um, and it's simply put that not everyone learns very well from an academic standpoint, from a textbook uh, way of presenting information, um, from a research heavy uh, you know, way of uh, receiving information, um, but that doesn't mean that they don't deserve to learn that information. Um, I think public scholarship is taking existing work and making it accessible, um, and that can cover a variety of topics, whether that's historical subjects, whether that's bringing relevancy uh, to cultures and highlighting and recognizing said cultures. Um, a lot of my work um, has been involved uh, with relevant relevancy involving the Civil War and Reconstruction, uh, the legacy of these plantation sites uh, throughout the Southeast. Um, and it's, it's pretty incredible how many people, the average visitor, might view all of this as something a long, long time ago, or something like the Constitution being this singular piece of paper. And how, how does that matter to me as an individual, as someone just living here in the United States? Why does this piece of paper signed in 1787 matter so much? And so public scholarship is bringing relevancy and awareness and helping the public to understand why what happened in the past really matters to us today. Um, how does that affect us as individuals in our everyday lives? Um, you know, the decisions that people made um, in the past centuries, um, you know, that stuff does affect us. And so it's our way of making those emotional connections to people so that they can have a better understanding of how our past shapes our current present. Um, how does this manifest itself in the context of digital humanities, um, I think was kind of the part two of your question, uh, Justin, um, you know, especially in this current slash post COVID, I think we're heading into post COVID hopefully world. Um, there is such an emphasis on moving into the digital space. Um, speak, I think I might be millennial still, but millennial slash Gen Z, 
audiences are certainly moving into a more and more digital space. And I think just having public scholarship available in the digital space is very important. Um, it certainly is a privilege to be able to visit spaces like national park sites. They are public. Um, we are considered national public land, um, but there are certain barriers that allow or disallow rather uh, certain cultural groups, people from certain economic statuses and classes classes um, that do prevent them from visiting our spaces physically. And so just because a visitor doesn't have the opportunity to visit these parks in person doesn't mean that they shouldn't be able to understand and gain knowledge from and gain experiences from these sites. You know, these are publicly funded for people to utilize and learn from. And so I think that going forward in the next five to 10 years, you will see a major shift from us just being these stagnant museum spaces a lot more into the digital space. And I'll talk more about my work specifically uh, with that as we continue on. Um, but I think that kind of concludes my answer for this portion. Uh, yeah, I think uh, Denise and Kelly both touched upon a lot of the themes that I would have within public scholarship, but I think it really is trying to take the scholarly research that, that I'm doing and basically making it available to broader audiences beyond the university and also just beyond my profession. And to me also, there's not one public out there that there are many publics not grocery stores, but publics that are out there. So um, I just want to be able to, kind of, to reach kind of all of them. I think there is this huge, sometimes huge gulf between what we are learning in academia, what I'm learning through the scholarship of archeology span and what the public knows. So I really want to kind of bridge that gulf between the two by finding kind of creative and innovative ways to get that information out to the public. As archeologists, we write mostly technical jargon laden reports for other archaeologists and sometimes the public doesn't see the benefits of what we do or if they do start to see it, it takes a long time for it to trickle down to them and by the time it trickles down to them we're already changing ideas or coming up with new ways of thinking about things so i think it's really important to try to get that information out to them as quickly as possible after we vetted it ourselves and we feel really comfortable about it and find ways ways to get it to them that that's kind of readable uh they and I think it was Agatha Christie or someone like this said something to the fact, how could a field like archaeologists with such wonderful finds write the driest reports of anybody? And so, I mean, that is true sometimes. You know, I'll give something to my wife and her eyes will glaze over after five minutes and she'll say to me, just tell me about the people. Just tell me about the people. And I always use that as kind of my mantra. Every time I start to get real technical with someone, I can hear Angela saying to me, tell them about the people, tell them about the people. So I think that's really kind of important to do. I want to do it in kind of a readable way, but I still want to have some of the nuances that are there. I don't want to boil it down. And they need to understand that research is messy that sometimes we don't, we don't all agree that there are things that are contested within the field. And that's not a sign of failure. To me, that's a sign that we're doing things right. And one of the things I really wanna to stress to the general public is not just spew out all these facts and all this important stuff. I want them to understand this is the database that we work with. This is the archeological record. This is the process that we go through to come up with these types of interpretations. So they understand that process itself and they can then see how it's done they can see how we start to eliminate things that we consider to be a lunatic fringe or we consider to be that the data is not there to support that this is how we come up with it and in, in archaeology our explanations our interpretations are always a work in progress as we get more information as we get more data we can alter these things i want them to really understand that just because we say we're not sure we don't know doesn't mean that that we're not we're not learning stuff. A lot of times we feel the more we learn, the less we know. And I think it's because we're asking much more sophisticated questions, you know, of our data. Um, I think archaeology has had a long history of trying to reach the public. And in fact, we have a an orientation in archaeology that's known as public archaeology. Uh, I think different archaeologists probably define public archaeology differently. But I really do think that it has to do with the, the public use and engagement with archaeology so that we can sometimes 
descendant communities, indigenous communities can use use archaeological data to support their their claims for land or support their histories. Uh, sometimes the government choose it for protecting uh, cultural resources. Uh, we engage the public. Uh, a lot of times through archaeology, we encourage the public to participate in what we're doing. Here at UNF, we do have field schools and we invite the public to participate, to come in and to see the process of what's going on. I also think we have a responsibility at time to counter racist uh, interpretations of the past or counter or debunk myths about indigenous people that are out there. So I think by getting this out there, it really helps to counter what they may hear on the History Channel or some of the other things on TV, where it's much more sometimes exciting than some of the things we're telling them, but how it really doesn't have any basis in reality, or how will they come up with those kind of spectacular types of interpretations that they are cherry picking out select data to use and they're ignoring so much else that's out there. They're doing this with an agenda in mind. So we want to be really open about the way we're interpreting things. We want them to understand that process so they can be skeptical, even skeptical of what we're saying, but skeptical in a way that's saying, well, show us the information that supports your, your answer. Don't just accept what I have to say about the indigenous people. I, I think it's good with sometimes when, when people in the public will, will challenge me in a, in a serious way about an interpretation that I've come up with. I really feel through public scholarship, we can learn from the public just as much as they can learn from us. Just like I feel I learn from students in class, I learn things from the public. So I wanna be able to engage with them and to be able to write uh, for them. I understand sometimes the writing we do for uh, fellow scholars is completely different. And it's, it's a challenge sometimes to be able to kind of straddle both of those things. But I think it's an important um, part of what we do. Yeah, as I'm listening to the three of you, um, some of the themes that sort of pop out are around the idea of like uh, creating more access to information, but also raising awareness at the same time, right? And so this notion of um, as we learn more, being able to, to challenge some of those preconceived notions and, and continue to develop and evolve uh, as we learn more, because uh, with this work, it seems like that there in particular, right, as we gain more information, that opens up more questions. And so how do we approach those questions? Um, and then ultimately, like, how are we bridging those gaps, right? And I think that's uh, all three, you mentioned that in various ways and, and creating relevancy around this information. So I think that, I mean, that sort of leads me to the next question around, so like, what are the products then of your public scholarship? What does that actually look like uh, for the individuals that you want to get that information out to? Um, I'm happy to start again, but also happy to let someone else start. Um, so I'll maybe I'll just tell a quick story, and um, and this will help. And I might let Keith talk about one of our one of our products. So you know they're tangible products. Like we've produced with UNF students a wonderful permanent exhibit on Indigenous Northeast Florida that's at the Jack's Beaches Museum. As we were producing it, and as it was it was supposed to open, I think March 27, 2020. So right as COVID hit um, and everything shut down. And so we pretty quickly transitioned to recognizing the need for digital humanities and for our students to be trained in that. So right now we have students working on um, a digital humanities site that um, mirrors our book and some of the major themes in our book um, that we're working on to make that work very accessible, right? Beyond a sort of physical space in Jack's speech that you would have to go to, um, to encourage what we've been talking about, that, that bridging the gap, that taking elements of scholarship and making it make sense to the public and offering them a much more complex understanding of the very deep indigenous history of our region. Um, and I have a talk that I've given around Jacksonville in a number of different spaces for about two years. And it's a myth busting um, talk. And so it usually, when I can give it in person, actually gets quite a lot of people. The first time I offered it, 100 people came to the Jack Speeches Museum because it had the word myth in it, right? And what I did was I critiqued local sites. Um, unabashedly. And I said, here are the four major myths circulating in all of our local sites about indigenous people. And the most effective product of that kind of talk um, is symbolized by a gentleman who came up to me afterwards. And he said, you know, I've been to every local museum and site. I love local history. And I suddenly realized 
that indigenous people just disappear from the exhibits and I've never wondered why. Because a lot of my talk was about the false narrative of extinction that's so damaging in our region and the way in which indigenous people are depicted as just gone um, and sort of the backdrop actors to the real show, which is colonization by the French and Spanish. And in a region where we still celebrate colonialism um, openly and unabashedly and unapologetically with cupcakes and alcohol um, and memorials um, that celebrate colonization, that, that laud colonization, um, it, that is a huge outcome. To have someone suddenly realize that they need to read and look at materials differently and I think whenever these folks now go to a museum site or a state park or a national park, I hope that what they do is they don't just absorb the information passively, but that they say, what's missing here? What's being silenced? Whose story is this? And is this the right story, the only story? Whose stories are being left out? So in terms of product, to me, that's the most important thing that someone could get out of whatever we actually produce is this kind of critical awareness of the selectivity of history and the power of history. And I know we're getting to the power later on. Um, and for example, my grad students who are working on an indigenous walking tour of Fort Caroline, where you'll go to Fort Caroline and on your phone, you'll pull up this alternate interpretation and have stops all along the way where you can read about different elements of indigenous history in the region. Um, it's really Satariwa, Mokama speaking to Mukwa territory. Um, they, they are doing as one component of that, not a critical read of the museum, but instead teaching people how to read a museum critically, because it's more important for them to learn to do that than to have alternate facts, right? So although they are developing components that have alternate facts, it's more important actually to teach people to be critical thinkers and to do that even in spaces where they think of themselves as passively absorbing the material. Um, so to me, that's really the most important element. Um, and we have to really rethink spaces like Fort Caroline, which is an indigenous space that has thousands of years of indigenous history, but has been made into a white space unapologetically in the 1950s by a congressman who repeatedly voted against the Civil Rights Act. It was made into a white space and it remains a white space today. So these are the kinds of things that gently I want to encourage a broad audience to think about. Um, I'll, oh, Dr. Ashley, did you want to go next? You're fine. Okay, um, I'll, I'll build off of that. Um, Dr. Bosi, you touched on a very uh, important notion um, that I will touch on briefly um, and then continue on with the question. Um, you were saying how Fort Caroline was built as a white space and continues to be a white space. Um, that is something that is being addressed nationwide throughout the National Park Service. Um, these were segregated spaces at, at a certain point. Um, and it doesn't take really a genius or any sort of of demographic survey to look at a national park and see who the average visitor is. Um, even to spaces like Reconstruction Era National Historical Park. Um, Beaufort was majority black until about the 1970s until it became gentrified. And the average person coming to visit that park looked a lot more like me than anyone else. And so that is something systematically that we are trying to work through. Um, you know, one of the big things that really stood out to me and that I learned a lot from from working at that space and that I'm bringing to this space you know I worked at a black history site I now work at one of the colonizers sites I work at a plantation home that was owned by one of the signers of the constitution um, you know it's not separate pieces of history it's all integrated so it's it's not okay, we're going to do a talk about enslavement, and then we're going to do a talk about Mr. Pickney and all the nice things that he did. It's all integrated. We need to speak about these spaces, the good, bad, and ugly, all in, in one encompassing conversation. Um, you know, I see other plantation sites in the Charleston area. Um, there is an emphasis now uh, to include more of these stories, the stories and voices of the enslaved, uh, but so often I see that that is offered as a separate program topic, that if you want to go and learn about that, then that's at two o'clock. 
And then our main house tour is offered five times a day. Um, I think that removing that notion is extremely important. Um, it's not two separate forms of history. It's just painting the larger, bigger picture and giving the complete story to the visitor. Um, I always tell people that I think talking about any historical figure in any other way than other how they lived their life is a disservice to who they were. And so people, for example, you know, paint President Lincoln as the great emancipator, um, but Lincoln did not believe in true equality between the races here in the United States. And so why would I portray his legacy and what he believed any differently than how he said it? Um, I want to say exactly how Mr. Lincoln said it, and there's no sugarcoating any of those topics. And so I think, I know that's a lot of different points I just made, I think there is a collective movement and understanding um, with this next generation of interpreters and rangers that are starting to work for the Park Service and work in museum spaces and public history spaces to have a better understanding or representation of history that happened at these sites. Um, and so I really appreciate you talking about Fort Caroline and kind of a nod to that. Talking about the products that we have produced in the public scholarship space, um, like I said, the National Park Service is taking a step more into the digital space, and I think that we will see that continuing to grow um, over the coming decades. There's such a demand for it, and it's all about making these histories a lot more accessible, uh, whether that's classroom visits. Um, last year, I talked to 1,500 different Beaufort County Elementary School students uh, talking to them about these large, very difficult pieces of history, the transition from enslaved to a free society, um, voting rights, um, you know, the 14th Amendment is the naturalization and citizenship amendment. And it's important not to water any of those topics down. Um, you know, children can understand racism. Children can understand difficult subjects. You don't have to equate it to, well, not everybody gets an equal piece of the candy bar. You can tell them real pieces of history. Um, they're people too. And so that is something that we really tried to, to move forward with and promote um, at my previous site and at this one. Uh, probably our most tangible product that we created and continued to work with at Reconstruction Era and that I will be implementing at this national park uh, was our Ranger Chats on Reconstruction. Uh, it was a highly successful video series that we started at the start of the pandemic. And that is simply when we started reaching out to historians as well as other park rangers. And we said, hey, you know, you're working on this book talking about, you know, um, Black women who were spies during the Reconstruction Era or during uh, the Civil War era. Tell us about your work. Or, you know, hey, um, you're a park ranger who is a friend of mine. Um, I think I see one of my ranger friends, uh, John Fowler, if that's the John Fowler that I know. Um, hello, thank you for joining. Uh, John Fowler is one of the um, rangers at Mary McLeod Bethune National Council House, which is in Washington, D.C. We did a video together. Mary McLeod Bethune became my hero because she was a woman whose parents were born enslaved. Um, and then she went the extra mile. She went on to establish um, a school for girls. She went on to be not only the first black college president, but the first female college president in our nation's history. And so we started doing these videos, highlighting pieces of history, highlighting historians work, and it's getting the public excited about these things. You know, I never would have considered my Myself a civil war enthusiast. I never would have found myself in this field because it always felt so inaccessible to me. The field of civil war history in this time period was always the gray haired older white guy from the South who knew way more about thread counts and, and button counting and what artillery that they used more than I would ever know. But once I found my connection through individual people stories, people like Mary McLeod Bethune, people like Sojourner Weaver, the first Black woman to win a case against a white man in federal court, she won the uh, custody of her child who had been sold into slavery, that is real amazing American history that we began to highlight in these bite-sized, easy-to-understand videos hey, this is American history that you should care about. And the people, the public gets excited about it. 
And so um, we did a really good job. And what I continue to hope to do here um, at the Charles Pickney site is highlighting these parts of American history that get people excited. Um, it's something that they can see that they can grab onto. And so we're taking the Ranger chat from Reconstruction series and implementing it here in the form of constitutional chats, talking about the amendments to the Constitution, reaching out to other national parks saying, hey, tell me about the 19th Amendment and women's right to vote. What are the good, bad, and ugly parts of it? Did that include everyone? No, it didn't. You know, we can talk to, um, I'm reaching out to a friend, a different national park to talk about the 15th Amendment, the expansion of voting rights to black men. Uh, I believe that was 1872. Let's get into the nitty gritty of it. And how does that matter today? Do we talk about voting rights today? If you turn on the news, we do an awful lot. Um, and so these videos have done a really good job of connecting people, like we were talking about at the beginning of this conversation, to these really large historical topics that might seem inaccessible, that might seem too above your head to understand, and really bringing it down to a personal level for people to get excited about and to understand. So. Yes, yeah, so I think um, archaeology really is kind of deeply invested in public engagement, public outreach, public um, education. Now, that may vary among archaeologists, but uh, I take it pretty seriously. So I do a lot of things to try to engage the public in which there's, you can say there's products. I mean, some of the most basic and simplest things is just public lectures all the time. I mean, I'll go talk to homeowners associations, rotary clubs, uh, L I've was at an elementary school last week. So really trying to get that information out just to so many different people. Um, we do pamphlets and booklets. Uh, so we did a big project uh, a thousand years ago. Um, and a lot of people don't realize that the community that was here in the St. John's River in the Fort Carolina area has these connections throughout the entire um, Eastern United States. So we have materials that are coming from Cahokia, which is near St. Louis, Missouri. And most of the people, they think, oh, they're just simple little Indians who are living by the tidal marshes with their little nice little uh, patch of corn. And that's about it. And it's a lot more dynamic and diverse than that. And so nuanced. So it's nice just to get that information, basic information out to them. Um, like Denise said, um, we're hoping to work on a public facing book uh, that's was really important to both of us, not to focus just on what she's doing or just what I'm doing. We wanted the entire hist indigenous history of this area. So we, we see that there's this false divide between prior to Europeans and after Europeans. We want this to be a continuous history from a, an indigenous perspective. Even then, when we start looking at what would be called contact or the mission period. We want to kind of turn that on its head and start looking at it with the indigenous people centered and how that was, how that transpired and how that affected them. We're giving it all too often from a colonial perspective and just in the terminology that you, so we're trying to start with the, just some of the basic vocabulary and terminology and really reorient that towards indigenous people so that people can start thinking about the history completely different. We're trying to reframe it and showing that there are different perspectives to history. Even within our fields, there can be different perspectives. Um, museum exhibits is another way to try to have a product. We've had temporary exhibits at MOSH where we've really highlighted all the research that we're doing here. We've had, um, we're hoping the one that Denise and I have done with our class is going to be a permanent long-term exhibit at the Jacksonville Beaches Museum. And I really encourage everyone to go look at it. It's completely different than any of the other museum ex exhibits. I think sometimes you can walk to other museums and not to really heavily criticize them, but you're really looking at an indigenous history through the eyes of the 1990s or 19, even 1980s. So we're trying to really give a really fresh look on that from different things. You can go there and hear Tamukwa, Mokama being spoken for the first time in 500 years. Even though we heard Denise speak it earlier today, it's really impressive, it's impactful to really start to hear those words here for the first time in 500 years. So I think that's another way is to get that information uh, out there. Uh, we have public workshops. I think one area where we differ a little bit from public history is we also advocate for the protection of cultural resources for archaeological sites. That's important to us. So we're always trying to get the public help and support to realize, hey, these are finite resources. 
that there are only X number of sites in Jacksonville that date to 1000 AD. And once one's gone, that's one less, and there's another less and another less. So we need to really start to protect our, our heritage. So um, that's another thing we really want to get that information out. In archaeology, we also have Archaeology Month in Florida. It's in March. So we always do stuff to really promote the local archaeology and indigenous history of this area. Uh, I agree with Denise that really one of the takeaways from all these public talks and lectures is really to provide the, the audience with tools for them to really assess and look at the indigenous history here in a, in a different way, to critically um, evaluate what's been said in the past and really how that may not be correct. Um, I think one of the big um, myths that Denise has been great at, at busting is that they're not extinct, they're not gone. Uh, but if you go to every museum here, it kind of ends that way. All of a sudden, 1700 comes along and you never hear about them again. They start talking about all other types of British history, Spanish history, uh, French history, American history, but there's no indigenous people. But we know for a fact that if you look in the documents here, one of the big concerns that the Spanish had was not disease as much as all the people who are just leaving this area and indigenous people who are tired of the new world order and they don't want to be a part of it. So they're going to the interior. They're mixing with other groups. So there's really no doubt in my mind that the Seminoles and Miccosukee of today have heritage that comes from the Jacksonville area within them. So it is part of their history. So they're still in a way here. So I think that's one of the important things to get out there. I think we're just starting to get at least here in archaeology, into the digital realm. Archaeology is data laden. We have lots and lots of data. We're really open to using very innovative technological ways to assess and utilize and manipulate that data. We just haven't used it a lot towards public outreach and public archaeology. But I think that's something that's starting to change within the last couple of years within archaeology, not just using social media and using other kind of platforms like that, but starting to create websites that are much more interactive with all these great tools within them that really can help people to learn the past in different ways. And sometimes that's more conducive for certain people to learn the past. So it's really open up these different ways. We don't want to focus on one media. We want to be able to put it out there in so many different media that it can accommodate a wide range uh, of peoples. Great. Thank you, everyone. Uh, so real quick, as you all saw in the chat box, just to make sure if anyone has any questions that we, we can address them. So again, if, if anyone in the, who's attending has a question for our panelists, we'd love to entertain that at this time. Okay, Felicia, please feel free. Uh... Hi, everyone. Hi. Uh, thank you so much for this great conversation. It's um, you know wonderful to hear more about each of your individual work and the collaboration, uh, particularly between uh, Denise and Keith. So thanks for uh, sharing that. Um, I really appreciated uh, you know particularly the conversation about not only making history accessible to various publics but also. Um, you know, the, the necessity of teaching folks how we even do history, right, to really engage with them uh, and, and encourage this critical awareness, right, Denise, that you were talking about, about the power of history, about the various silencing and distortions that we really need to consider when even approaching various historical topics. Um, so I think that's such an important, you know, issue when talking about public history, right? Teaching folks how we even approach history to begin with. Um, I was uh, really struck, Kaylee, by your uh, previous uh, conversation about sort of the emotional reactions that you encounter when um, dealing with folks that are visiting the plantation site. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about sort of how you manage that emotional labor of encountering difficult histories because this is something that I, you know, try and have a conversation with uh, my students about. Um, yeah, I teach African American history, so of course this is a lot, a lot about difficult histories. So I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that kind of emotional encounter that various visitors um, are having, and, and how you kind of approach that, and and even maybe how the digital changes that emotional encounter. Sure. Um, excellent question. Um, and uh, can I ask what grade do you teach uh, your African-American history class to? Oh, I teach here at UNF. 
Oh, okay. So I'm so sorry. Yeah. Maybe we didn't have any overlap, but wonderful. <laughs> um, great. Um, so yeah, so obviously, and I'll kind of uh, preface this by saying um, my experience providing interpretation at plantation sites and at Black history sites is radically different than my coworkers who are uh, men and women of color. So I do have a certain privilege uh, that comes along with my position at my parks talking about this. Um, that doesn't mean my blood pressure doesn't go up sometimes. <laughs> um, you know, uh, people, the public, um, you know, we, we, the average visitor means no harm. Um, you know, 95% of people are coming asking a genuine question. Um, I just had somebody ask me a couple of days ago if uh, Charles Pickney was benevolent to the people whom he enslaved, and the short answer is no. And then we talk about that on, you know, a more detailed level. You know, this is the primary source documents we have understanding what was going on here. Um, I received many, many harsh comments whenever working at Reconstruction Era uh, National Historical Park talking about the transition from enslavement to freedom. Um, you know, the best way to combat these types of discussions or, you know, misinformation is through education, uh, I fully believe. Um, you know, you're one in 100 person that comes up ready to start an argument, you're not going to change their mind. Um, they are coming uh, with a purpose, you're not going to change their mind, and, um, you know, you're better kind of saving your, your mental health um, and educating a visitor who is open to interpretation. Um, you know, we really try, I really try to put an emphasis on the voices um, who were affected by these histories. Um, so talking about my experience in Beaufort, um, the, it was the first uh, black military troop. Um, so it's pre 54th Massachusetts, the men of the first South Carolina volunteers were the first black men officially enlisted in the United States Army. Um, and their uh, command came from a white uh, general um, from Massachusetts, uh, one from Boston, one from Cambridge. And instead of highlighting their musings, and we have wonderful diaries from them, we have wonderful primary sources from them. We try to do a really good job of going from the perspective of those going, those going through this transition. You know, um, I hope that kind of, I think I kind of jumped around a little bit, but I try and I think the Park Service tries to get perspectives um, and voices um, from a diverse variety of people, not just one way. Um, we have some great primary sources um, from many um, you know, African Americans from this time period and just highlighting their emotions, their struggles, how they're feeling, I think is, is really important to allow visitors to connect to these histories. Um, you know, I really appreciating highlighting individual stories, like I mentioned earlier, Mary McLeod Bethune, uh, she's a, she should be everybody's superhero and role model. You know, um, I had a wonderful conversation with, uh, John Fowler about her and loved learning about her. And so, um, you know, getting people excited and happy about these various uh, tangibles, I think is really important and helps people to understand a lot more. Um, you know, a lot of people talk about, oh, well, it isn't black and white. It isn't one way or the other way, you know, looking at these individual personal parts of history, I think helps people to have an emotional connection better, if that makes sense. I hope I didn't jump around too much with that. Um, also, I will, this is something I did want to share that was very unique about my experience there, um, helping people understand that none of this history was really that long ago, I think is really important. Um, we're very few generations removed uh, from the period of Reconstruction. Um, and then depending on who you talk to, some people say that Reconstruction was 100 years long and that it continued until the 1960s civil rights movement. Um, but uh, I had a gentleman come and show me his family's labor contract. I mean, they received, um, you know, their citizenship with the passage of the 14th Amendment, um, and then they physically signed with an X because they were illiterate, um, a labor contract, which they worked, um, and then they were actually able to save up enough money to purchase that land. 
Um, and the great, great grandson still owns said land today. And so highlighting stories like that, I think is really important too. Again, bringing the current, you know, today and making the past relevant to today. I mean, this is a gentleman that I got to talk to. He knows his ancestor's name. He has his physical signature and making people and helping people realize that all of this really wasn't that long ago. And the effects of these time periods do impact us today. Um, I loved talking about and kind of riling some people's feathers about the loophole to the 13th Amendment incarceration um, as punishment for a crime and getting people to make connections, you know, from that to today. Um, I hope that kind of answers your question. You can also just message me separately too. We could talk about this for a long time, I'm sure. <laughs> Uh, so as we put in the chat, we understand that we're, we're a little over originally scheduled time at this point, but if uh, people are able to hang out just for a little bit longer, we have one more question that we'd like to ask and think to help sort of bring some things back around. Um, and so really the this last question is thinking about like, what is the, the role of power in public scholarship and what does that mean uh, for public scholarship? And uh, Denise, if you don't mind sort of kicking us off with that one, it'd be great. Yeah, this is the most important question of the day. Um, you know, I think we've entered into really fruitful conversations about the power of memorials and the way in which we memorialize particular historical figures who are not only, you know, deeply troubled and invested in slave holding and white supremacy, but we have only just begun to consider how many of our public spaces do the same and support that work. Um, and when I go to museums in particular, but also state and national parks, my first question is who is who's coming here? And with very few exceptions, like uh, like uh, Fort Mose in St. Augustine, which does a totally different narrative and attracts a very diverse group. Most of the folks going to these places are white and between the ages of 40 and 70. And that's the audience. And my next question will be, because there'll often be some resistance to, change, to making more inclusive narratives. And I'll say, are you happy with who's coming here? Are you representing everybody in your community in the United States? Are you drawing enough people? Um, and the answer is no. When we create exclusionary narratives that only look at things from a singular perspective, not only are we keeping out all sorts of people who are part of the rich, dynamic, diverse, contested, violent, colonized past, um, but we're also supporting white supremacy. And I see the work that Keith and I do as instrumentally tied to addressing the rise of white supremacy in, in our nation today. Um, we have to tell the truth about the past. And the truth about the past is that in our area, this was indigenous land and colonization was violent. And the Spanish and French ought not to be celebrated for their, for their violent takeover of indigenous spaces. And when we celebrate that from a young age, we really are doing such a disservice to human beings and citizens of our nation. Um, the second thing I would say is that we're, we're responsible to the communities whose past we seek to tell and to their descendants. Um, and so Keith and I are responsible to indigenous people today. Um, we've started just one conversation with the Seminole tribe because we're at the start of our project. And this is the time when you reach out to indigenous communities at the start, not the middle, not the end, to tell them, this is the work we wanna do. What do you think? Um, and what they think is that our work should also be in service of them. Um, they claim Tumukwas and Yamases and Wales among their ancestors, but they also have ongoing issues today. Um, their sovereignty is assaulted today. And so to do public history doesn't mean to just tell a story to a local audience, but to also be really responsible to the peoples whose story we are telling. Um, and I don't think enough sites do that. And there are lots of structural reasons for that that we have to create easier ways to get around. For example, at Fort Caroline, they would like to tell a more diverse story, but because of the way it was crafted, um, they have to memorialize the French. And so that requires a congressional action to undo. So there are really like, this is structural racism at work in public history. Um, and so we really have to keep, keep doing this work. It's, it's really important and the power is everything. 
go, Keith. Do you have anything you'd like yeah, to add? Just real quickly to tag yeah. on to that. Yeah, I think that through our, through our work, research, archaeology, history, we can help to empower indigenous people and descendant communities. So I think that's really important and kind of part of our role. I think archaeology has really opened up to much more collaboration and communication with indigenous uh, peoples than in the past. So I think right now we see a lot of archaeologists trying to share or establish dialogue with indigenous people. I think we now understand more than ever that there are indigenous ways of understanding the past. There's indigenous knowledge, there's indigenous ontologies, that there are multiple views of the past that we can, that that sometimes there may be tension between them, but they can coexist and they're just as important as what we're trying to say. So I think that is really, really important to acknowledge that. I think in the past, sometimes archeologists considered themselves kind of the stewards of the real authentic indigenous past. And that really the Indians today, they just know about recent Indian history. We know about it. I think that's completely changed within the broader field of archeology span for the better. And sometimes indigenous people have problems with archeologists or archeologists in the past. And I think we're really trying to change that relationship with indigenous people. And I think it is particularly the younger generation of archeologists. I think it's starting to swing more towards a really good relationship between us because there are a lot of things that happened in the seventies and eighties that are strongly still held by some of the older indigenous people uh, towards archeology. span So I think that's really important that we become much more open and less insular in terms of sharing and having dialogue about how to understand the past, that we are not the sole authorities of the uh, sole interpreters you know, of the past. I'll speak for one second on that too. There is a shift in the field of interpretation. So taking Dr. Ashley and Dr. Bosi's work and bringing it to the public to shift to what's called ACE interpretation, audience-centered experiences. And so we're going away from the ranger-driven lecture where here is the information that I'm presenting to you and going from a more interactive, immersive experience. Everyone in this conversation right now Every visitor coming to a park that I work for has a different view and interpretation that they can provide and add to the conversation. And that is every bit, if not more important than my contributions and what I'm saying to them. You know, I had um, quite a few people tell me their experience working at Reconstruction Era National Historical Park. This is my family's history that maybe goes against what my exhibit said. And that's okay because just because I'm, you know, on paper, the subject matter expert, or I study this stuff, doesn't mean that I know every little thing. I think uh, having a, a, a career and a position like myself and Dr. Ashley and Dr. Bosi, you might be able to speak to this as well. You kind of have to have a sense of humbleness and humility about yourself because sometimes we're told differently than, you know, we may have researched or may have known. And, and that's okay. I want to hear from from the descendant communities, from those who have experienced these hardships, you know. Um, I also think having these spaces that the audience-centered experience form of interpretation allows for emotional connection and emotional healing even, you know. Uh, spaces like Fort Sumter, it might be a long time before we fully get there, but Fort Sumter, the place where the Civil War began, I mean, that can be a space where reconciliation and understanding can happen. Um, unfortunately, I don't know if the average visitor is ready for those difficult conversations yet, but it's our job as the National Park Service to create space for those conversations to happen. I can't tell the visitors how to talk or, or how to act or what to say to one another, but I think the Park Service, my job and us as a whole, is to set up these conversations to allow for it to heal and happen. And right now, the current exhibit at the home that I'm standing in is pure text, pure information, and no way of connecting the average person to these larger conversations. Really excited to have this completely redone uh, for next fall. And we're even having some of the exhibits even like connect to the women's rights movements of the 20 teens that have been happening in more recent years. And so the exhibit, although stagnant, will allow for a conversation to take place, you know, and whenever we give programming or do talks or that sort of thing, you know, opening it up towards the audience to give their input, I think is really, really valuable. And we as interpreters can learn a lot from it. 
And then the audience can learn from each other as well. Yeah, thank you all. Um, I really appreciate everyone's comments today and for our attendees for uh, being here with us. And I think one of the things that I'm gathering from the conversation is really the importance of relationships when it comes down to public scholarship in its various contexts, because it's not a, it's not just one relationship. There's multiple relationships that are constantly sort of like thinking about like the, an atom, how they're, these electrons are just flowing around this central um, of the, you know, the, the molecule that we're talking about, but, uh, it, and they're constantly in flux. They have to negotiate with each other as well. And so this idea of how we continue to share this work and develop the work and the process of the work. And I think that's another important aspect of it is that there's a process to this, right? And, and you've heard that in different contexts today as well, but ultimately some of the crux is around the concept of, of relationship and, and what that means to the work, to the people, to the public, uh, to the students, to the faculty members, to those who are doing this on a regular basis. So again, thank you all to our panelists today. Um, great information uh, in this conversation, uh, anthropology and history beyond the academy. And uh, again, thank you to all the attendees uh, for today's session. Uh, as a reminder uh, that today's session does conclude the 2021 Digital Project Showcase. It is also the beginning of the roundtable series that will continue in the spring. Uh, and in the spring, uh, there'll be additional conversations with other disciplines and projects with a focus on public scholarship and in the context of the digital humanities. Uh, so at this time, uh, just gonna turn things back over to Dr. Ann Pfister for some uh, quick closing remarks. Well, I just wanna echo what Dr. Sipes has said. Um, thank you to our panelists. Thank you to the participants in the audience. And really this is, you know, the beginning of a really, really nice beginning to a longer conversation. Um, you know, I'm inspired and I was writing down a couple of notes on things that I'd really like to follow up to both as the co-sponsor of Lambda Alpha and especially as director of the DHI that there, you know, we really, it's, I think it's time to start getting together around these issues physically. <laughs> um, and I think that there, there might be some opportunities for us to go to that museum exhibit and, you know, part, get the public to these public spaces, right? Um, and, and I think that, you know, at the University of North Florida, we have a, a unique opportunity because we're in, in contact with so many students and those students have families and, you know, it is an important part of it. As an anthropologist, I, I try to give, you know, make things digestible and give my students handouts to take home at Thanksgiving, for example, to talk about, you know, race and other kinds of things because Many, as we know, many of their families don't have the opportunities to sit into in a university classroom, and and so the idea that we're you know really sharing this important information is um, you know that the, those networks are potentially endless, right? Um, and there's lots of work ahead of us, as Kaylee pointed out, as all of us really have pointed out. But it's it's good work, and I'm really just very impressed with with all of your work your dedication to the field and, and to the public spaces. And um, as I mentioned to Kaylee, I'll, I'll make this quick, but as I mentioned to Kaylee early on, um, you know, seeing you in your, in your young uh, career right now, and as a recent graduate of UNF is an inspiration to other students. It shows them what, what is possible in these fields, you know, especially when their parents at Thanksgiving dinner next week might be saying, well, what are you gonna do with an anthropology degree? And what are you gonna do with a history degree? And this is a way of connecting that, but you're also really an inspiration to us as your former professors. So um, congratulations, everyone. Thank you very much for your time on this Friday afternoon. And um, I look forward to this continued conversation. Thank you all for allowing me to speak. Um, I'm happy to stay on for a few minutes with, I have, there's a couple of former professors on here. I see Dr. Akita, uh, India was a good friend of mine, history program, of course, Dr. Meyer. So I'm happy to stay on a few more minutes just to, to talk shop and catch up with professors. <laughs> uh, but thank you all again for joining. I just want to say okay. how how proud I am of you, Kaylee. You did such a good job. I was beaming through all of that. Oh, thank you.